Hello, I'm Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo. Uh, welcome again. We're at Neuro Series Episode Three. Uh, the neuro some of the, some of the information on the neurobiological findings of eating disorders, just to kind of essentially make a case of why an eating disorder is a biological based disorder, um, not just a psychological based disorder. And uh, I'm going to just get right into it. Uh, I, I'm usually using uh, this slide here. I have some citations on it. And as I explained in Neuro Series 2, uh, I often you're going to see my slides. They're going to have citations, the title of the journal article and where it comes from. Uh, just to let you know, this is based on uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals. Uh, that's where I'm kind of translating the information from. Uh, and... It's not just something that I'm saying off the top of my head and that this information is becoming more and more available. It's kind of like when I said again in episode two, it's the body of, uh, of information that's coming out that is completely behind the support for the biological basis of eating disorders. So this these, some of the articles that are out there are, are published that kind of make the case that eating disorders have a strong biological basis is there have been studies and incidences where people have both spontaneously uh, recovered from and spontaneously acquired eating disorders because of different types of brain traumas, uh, which can include uh, strokes, uh, brain tumors, and other types of brain lesions, um, where someone just didn't develop disordered eating, but they actually developed an eating disorder, uh, and, and, and others have spontaneously recovered from it. Uh, so it's, it's hard to understand what was the mechanism that caused that eating disorder to kind of spontaneously occur or recover. But we know that different types of very intense traumas have uh, uh, ex uh, been held accountable for doing so. Um, uh, Cynthia Bullock uh, and her colleagues do a lot of work in the genetic basis of eating disorders. And when you look at essentially how much does heritability contribute to the onset of an eating disorder. You can see in the numbers in the lower right-hand corner um, the difference uh, uh, of, of, of studies that have shown the amount of contribution uh, that heritability plays in the role of developing an eating disorder, essentially. So if somebody kind of says to me, uh, hey, Dr. DeSarbo, you know, like, why do I have an eating disorder? And you know, I, I often talk about these types of studies um, where for anorexia nervosa, 48 to 74 percent can be accounted for with, uh, with genetics and with bulimia, 55 to 62 percent, binge eating disorder, 39 to 45 percent. And, you know, so, so there is a significant contribution that comes from genetics. Now, um, most people are going to collect a family history when they first meet a, a client. And one of the questions is, you know, in your family, in addition to medical history and everything, uh, does anyone have an eating disorder? And there are many cases where um, you get histories where it's definite positives. Yes, my sister has one as well, and she's in treatment. My mother had one, told me about it. I, or they have distant relatives, aunts and cousins. Uh, other people will kind of give a, a well, uh, there are some interesting patterns my father has with his eating, but never technically diagnosed. Or, you know, my, my, my cousin has some odd behaviors, but no one speaks about it. And then there are people who say, no, I have no idea, no clue of anybody in my family who has an eating disorder, which again, isn't unusual because most people are not walking around talking about and sharing information of the, the, about their eating disorder because so many people feel embarrassed or ashamed. And so it's hidden. It's kept a secret. They don't want people to know. And families often then continue to do the same type of thing. So it's hard always to get an accurate, um, uh, reliable source of information as to family history with an eating disorder. But you can see there's, there's usually something there that sets a person up. Um, now, if you're genetically prone to an eating disorder, you may or may not 
end up having it set in motion. This isn't just an eating disorder. This can be things like somebody who, who has cardiovascular disease, and they may be prone to having a cardiovascular event or a heart attack. And depending on their genetics, those could, it could be a strong um, predisposition to developing that. And no matter what they do and how well they take care of themselves and, and exercise and live a healthy lifestyle, they could still have an event. While other people, um, if they're prone to it and, and, and they don't take care of themselves and live a healthy lifestyle, may definitely have, have uh, that event occur and arise maybe sooner than later. Um, so with genetics, there's this concept of epigenetics, and that's what sets that, that eating disorder in motion, even if you're prone to it. Again, like I said in the beginning with the four Ps, there are the things that predispose you, which are kind of like your genetics, and then there are... are are things that kind of set it in motion with those genetics. That's, that's what, what kind of um, people call epigenetics is a term used where there's this chemical methylation of, along the DNA strand of genes that kind of turns them on and makes those genes become more active. And some of the things that affect the methylation of the DNA and the concept of any epigenetics includes things like just basic human development. You know, uh, how does somebody, you know, if you have strong genetics, just developing along the lines that that process may occur. There's psychological states that are affected by things like trauma, mood, stressors, personality, personality disorders. Um, there's medical states, diseases, medications, uh, all types of things in the medical realm that can kind of uh, turn that gene on. There's social and interpersonal reactions, child rearing exposures, relationships. Um, there's diet and exercise, which can turn on that eating disorder gene. Uh, drugs, chemical exposures, socioeconomic status, culture expectations, expectations that one places upon themselves. And more and more recently, uh, the research is coming out that uh, is around uh, personal and sexual identity issues. You know, how does one kind of conceptualize who they are and, and with their personal identity? But then there's more and more coming out with issues around sexual identity and how that affects the, the onset, the type, and, and, and kind of the treatment and course of an eating disorder when people have issues with sexual identity. What's important to know is when you look at the research, you're going to, across all the journals, this is showing you the different lobes of the brain. There's the limbic system on the inside of the brain. And there are articles on all of these brain regions and what's different about them in individuals with eating disorders versus what they're always referring to as a healthy control, which means somebody who does not have an eating disorder. And the changes are apparent. There are changes in brain volume, changes in the brain's anatomy to both the lobes uh, and tracks on the inside called the white matter tracks. Um, there's changes in the brain with chemistry, okay? So again, we talked about in the, in, in the last episode things like all the different types of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, ghrelin, uh, different types of, uh, of, of proteins like the BDNF, which we've already discussed, and, 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 and hormones like cortisol. There's changes in how the brain's blood flow works in individuals with eating disorders. Uh, you know, and we're going to cover some of that down the road of how, like, blood flow patterns are kind of, like, altered significantly for things like body image perception. The thing is, it takes a while in most cases for these long-term blood flow pattern changes to occur, you know, so you want to, that's why it's always good to get treatment as soon as you can, but when treating an individual, it can take a while to reverse some of these blood flow types of patterns that are seen. And also, again, going back to hormones and everything, there's differences in the brains uh, from a gender perspective. Uh, that causes differences in how people respond to treatment, the length and course of an eating disorder, the severity and the obstacles that are faced. So we'll be also, you know, coming across some studies as we move along through this uh, neuro series projection uh, with, with hormones. So essentially you have 
uh, all these different types of changes with eating disorders and changes in brain mass, changes in anatomy, chemistry, blood flow, and neurohormones. When, when, when all these types of changes are taking place in someone's head, you know, it's affecting your mind and, and how you think, how you act, how, how, how you reason. It's really changing how your brain is functioning. And that's clearly evident when people have a severe eating disorder and they're really not in a happy place. I've discussed previously and want to go back to this slide here that when we were talking about the, the biology and the neurobiology of eating disorders, you know, as we've discussed, one system can affect the brain. So cardiovascular system can affect how brain's functioning. The brain's functioning can then feed back and affect the cardiovascular system. It can affect the renal system. It can f affect the reproductive system, the immune system. So it's important to remember that there's this back and forth connection. And that's why, you know, Treatment teams must be in, in close contact with their physicians. It's, and, and these days it's hard to find, you know, medical doctors, physicians, general practitioners, internists who truly understand eating disorders and this back and forth feedback system that goes on with the brain-body access. But when we talk about recovery and uh, when I'm working with an individual, this is what I'm thinking about is that Neuro restoration, restoring the brain and the central nervous system is really what an eating disorder is all about and what recovery from an eating disorder is all about. It's kind of getting it back to baseline. Now, in the studies that are here, um, it, it, it shows how the volume of, of the cortical parts of the brain, the thickness uh, when, when people go into uh, remission, start to improve. It's kind of like a restoration of the, the brain uh, volume uh, returning back to where it should be. Um, and these are just some citations that show um, the importance of, of recovery and the consequences of recovery, which is brain volume changes that are positive. You see in the box there, there's the gray matter volume. That's the outer parts of the brain. That's the things you often think of. Now, it's, it's, it's shown that adults can lose between 3.7, 5.6% of their gray matter. Children, it can be up to 7.6% of their gray matter. The white matter, which is kind of those tracks you see in the, in the photo on this slide, um, the things that connect all the different parts and are communicating back and forth. Again, you, adults have, you know, 2.2 to 3.8 percent, children over 3 percent volume loss of white matter tracks. So if you think about an, a human being having, let's say, 100 billion, uh, 120 billion neurons and you're losing, let's say, 5 percent of that, you know, you're, you, you, we're talking about that affecting, you know, five, six billion neurons, you know, and I always say, I think of it when I'm working with a patient this way. Let's again say I'm working with someone with anorexia nervosa and they walk into my office, they tell me, hey doc, you know, I've, I've restored two pounds this week. Now, they may be upset or they're thinking, that's on my body, that's body tissue, that's fat, that's muscle, whatever. I'm calculating what percentage of that two pound weight restoration is volume restoration to the brain and central nervous system. And that can equate to several, you know, hundreds of millions of neurons kind of being involved in the restoration process. And if somebody again comes into my office and says, hey doc, you know, I, you know, I'm down another two pounds this week and they have anorexia nervosa. And it's, it's, it's something I start thinking again, you may have been affecting your brain volume matter by five, six billion neurons in the uh, opposite direction, you know, and that then is something I usually see just by talking to a patient, some slower cognition, how they're talking back and forth, if they're making sense, if they're tired, fatigued, their sleep cycles disturbed. So that's how, you know, often when I'm thinking about a patient who's having a lot of these symptoms uh, taking place in both restoration and, and, and with uh, weight loss and how it affects who they are as an individual as they sit on my couch and talk to me. Uh, so this lecture was basically just to give you a baseline um, idea about the biological 
aspects of an eating disorder, how it needs to be thought of, not just in what are we going to talk about in therapy and how are we going to handle stressors or how are we going to handle conditions like PTSD. That's all important because, you know, stressors, depression, anxiety, and PTSD um, are significantly involved in affecting the brain as well. Okay. So it has to be done from a therapeutic point of view, but it has to be done in a point of view that is actually involved with the medical and psychiatric restoration of the brain and central nervous system. Uh, so again, in uh, our next set of neuroscience uh, series, uh, uh, episode four, uh, we're going to look at more specific findings with eating disorders, beginning with the neurobiological discoveries in children and adolescents. Uh, and, you know, um, there is a difference in the brain of, of children and adolescents compared to treating adults with, with eating disorders. And that'll actually be, dis be discussed later in one of the neuro series topics about therapy and therapeutic approaches. Um, but uh, again, we're going, this is neuro series three that you've been listening to. I hope you've listened to the first two and I hope you'll continue on to neuro series four. And as I mentioned at the end of each slide, if there's any comments, questions, or if you'd like any uh, list of upcoming courses, certifications, please uh, go to these uh, um, sites and uh, you can send an email as well. Uh, so this is Dr. Jeffrey DeSarbo, and I will see you in our next series of neuroscience lectures on Neuroscience 4.